You're listening to a sermon from Bethel Church in Richland, Washington. Some portions may be removed due to copyright restrictions. To hear the sermon in its entirety, visit one of our campuses. For campus locations and other sermon-related material, visit our website, bethel-church.org. Good morning. Uh, it's, I am going to be, I'm, my name's John, I'm going to be preaching this week, and Dave is going to be back next week, but when Dave Bechtel, myself, and Dave Dawson got together, we were talking about preaching for this next coming year, and as Dave mentioned, Bechtel mentioned maybe a couple weeks ago, he wants us to be preaching through the one-year Bible, and uh, by the way, how many people uh, have just have a one-year Bible. This isn't like I've been reading or what, you know, but you have a one-year Bible. Okay, that's good. Um, If you don't, I bought mine. Uh, My wife and I are going to try to go through it because we figured if Dave was going to preach on this each week, that it would be great for us to be in it so that the stuff we've read is stuff we're still going to hear about it. We're that much more prepared for the sermon each week, which I thought was a pretty cool thing. But then Dave said, well, John, you get to do the first one, like the kickoff. So I'm like, okay, I got the blank slate. I can do whatever it comes out to be. So we're going to start at the beginning. Like, not go through the whole Bible today, don't worry. We're just going to hit Genesis. And uh, before I do, I have a question. How many of you have ever had a brush with a celebrity of any kind? Can you raise your hand? Like, you know, it'd be so fascinating, I'm sure, to hear the different stories. I knew a guy, I was speaking at a winter camp last year, and the youth pastor said, yeah, one time I was in an airport, and I, not literally, but I bumped into Shaquille O'Neal. And, I, and he said, he is bigger than you can imagine. And I mean, the guy's like seven foot. He said his hands were huge and his feet were huge. And he said his voice was just deep and booming. And he said it was pretty cool. I have never met uh, Shaquille O'Neal, but I have met somebody very exciting. And I have a picture, photographic proof of it. It happened when I was about two or three years old. And there I am. And that's the celebrity that I met. Can anybody, don't say it out loud, can anyone guess who it is? If you think you know who that might be, would you raise your hand? It's a little hard. I blocked out his face. Okay, here is the, the uh, hint. My wife bought me a shirt with this man's likeness on it. He has a, a t-shirt after him, and it says, it's good in the hood. Does anyone have any idea who this gentleman is, or perhaps that confirmed it? Let's take away, and do you recognize who this person is right here? <laughs> it's Mr. Rogers. Yeah, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And and that's me down there. You can see my sister and I are tying his shoes. And I was like really popular after that. Uh, One thing though, my sister often reminds me, I really honestly don't have much recollection, but she reminds me repeatedly that after we tied his shoes, he retied the one that I did. (laughs) That took about three years of counseling, so... But you know what? Today I'm going to tell you a story. I, that's, I'm, I'm getting Mr. Rogers out there because he was like, when I think storytellers, it was Mr. Rogers, you know? And I didn't, I didn't bring a sweater to change into or pop off my shoes or anything. But I want to tell you a story. And before I do, why don't I pray? And then we'll get to what we're going to talk about today. Jesus, again, we ask for you to be lifted up in this service today. Holy Spirit, will you come amongst us and do the work that only you can do? And will you lead us into where you want us to be? We are eager to see your movement because we know that it brings life. Amen. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And after he had created everything out of nothing, he spoke it into being. He made man and he put him in the garden. And he brought all the animals to man. He said, I want you to name every single one of these. And so he's naming them, and it's good. And God says, I have made every tree in this garden for you to eat, Adam. Only this one tree. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I don't want you to eat from that tree. For in that day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And Adam is naming the animals, and things are good, but God notices that he isn't quite fulfilled. And so he, God, creates woman. And he gives her to man, Adam. And Adam and Eve, they're in the garden, and we don't know how long they were in the garden together, but I'm sure it was a fabulous time. And then the serpent slithers in. A serpent is what it's named, but we really, we know that it's the enemy of the souls of humans. It's Satan, and he comes and he says to Eve, 
did God really say not to eat of any tree in this garden? Eve said, well, we can eat of the trees in the garden, but it's that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that we can't eat of it or touch it. For in the day that we do, we're going to die. Die? You won't die. Did he tell you that? God's holding out on you. No, actually, if you eat it, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. So Eve, seeing that the fruit is pleasing to the eye, good for food, and desirable for gaining this new wisdom, like God, she takes and she eats. And she hands it to Adam, and he eats. And immediately, they both knew that they were naked and they were ashamed. And they sewed for themselves some fig leaf coverings. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. And they were afraid. And they hid themselves. And God came and he said, Adam, where are you? Adam said, I, I was afraid because I heard you coming and I knew I was naked and I was ashamed. And Adam, have, have you eaten from that tree that I asked you not to eat from? It was the woman. She gave it to me. Eve, it was the snake. He did it. I ate it. And then God does something that is miraculous, sad for humans of what the snake did, but God does something more powerful. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It's a fun one, but it's also significant. And so, let's, if you like to take notes, let's go to point one. In our story today, Satan schemed to destroy. Satan schemed to destroy. It's very interesting because whenever you see Satan, he has schemes. Ephesians 6.11 says this, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Satan's got all kinds of schemes and strategies that he's trying to work, but he really only has one purpose in mind. Three things that he hopes for every human. Do you know what they are? Here it is. John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and... Yeah. Can we say that one more time just so we get that in our brains? The thief comes only to... You know what? That's his goal. He's all about, he's got lots of schemes, but all of them lead to those purposes. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, that said, check it out in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And Satan takes on this form of this crafty serpent, and he starts his first scheme. And that's point A. That's that he cast doubt on God's character. We're going to see it really clearly in the text. And it has become increasingly apparent to me that this is not simply in Genesis 3, but it happens in our day today. In Genesis 3, 1, it says this. Satan says to the woman, Did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, stop for a moment. Is that what God said? Did he say that they couldn't eat from any tree of the garden? No, what he actually said was that you could tr they could eat from any tree of the garden except one. Right away, Satan loves to misquote God. Loves to misquote him. And then, with his misquoting, then he goes on, and, and the woman says, no, 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 we can eat from every tree, it's just that one. And he says, did God really tell you you were going to die? No, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Right away, what he is trying to introduce is God's holding out on you, Eve. If you eat of this, you get to be like him. And he knows it, and he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to be like him, like you'd like to be. And Eve, seeing that the fruit is desirable... She grabs it because she doesn't trust that God has really got her best interest in mind. For a moment, think about 
how does Satan run that scheme on us? I mean, it happens. Perhaps it's a relationship that we want, but doesn't seem to be coming to us. Scott was very transparent and mentioned that, you know, he's looking for some companionship from single Christian ladies. Maybe there's that desire, and it's like God's not giving me that, and that frustrates me. Maybe it's like I'm so tired of this job that I'm in. You know, why doesn't God give me a better job or just a job? Why doesn't God take away this illness? Why doesn't he fix this difficulty in my life? And the word that Satan loves to bring is God can't be trusted. See, he doesn't really have your best interest at heart because if he did, this would be solved and you would have it. And he loves to cast doubt on God's character. And that's his number one scheme, I think, that you see from the text. The thing that gets me as I thought about this is that he tries to tell Eve that God doesn't want to share his Godhood with them. He doesn't want you to have any part of him. It's like he wants to hold it for himself. And I want to take you to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And we're going to look at that here for a second. This is talking about Jesus. And it says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness, and he died that terrible death on a cross. Interestingly, the very temptation that Satan is trying to get her to say, God doesn't really want you to have any part of him, Jesus says, no, I'm not trying to hold it for myself. I'm going to give it up. I'm going to limit my godhood so that you can have a way to be with me and my Father, so we can share it with you. Some of you today, I have no doubt, because I have been here many times, you're struggling with a dis some kind of a doubt about God's character. I have no doubt that in a size of group, this one, there are people who are saying, why, why is this happening to me? Is God really good? And that is a scheme of the enemy that's been there from the beginning. If you recognize that today, then the sermon is for you. Here's a second scheme that Satan likes to use, and you can see it straight from the scriptures. B, he exploited ignorance. It's kind of interesting. Sometimes I think we come to Bible stories, and we just assume that we kind of know them. And I know I do, and, and then I see something, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. In Genesis can we go to Genesis 3, 2 to 3? In Genesis 3, 2 to 3, it says, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did, not, but God did say, You must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And, what's the next phrase? You must not touch it. Did God really say that? No, actually, here's what God said. In fact, back in Genesis um, no, I'll tell you what. Here's what God said. God said you can't eat it. So why did Eve put that part in there about you can't touch it? Interestingly, Eve was not created when God gave the command to Adam not to eat the fruit. So some people have surmised, I think it's probably true, that Eve got her information from Adam. Hey, Eve, so good to have you here in the garden. Here's the one rule. See that one? You can't eat of it. And you can't even touch it. Now, perhaps Adam made up a line there where he said, hey, you know, God said you can't eat it. I'm saying don't touch it. That's not unwise, like to stay away from temptation. But somehow Eve didn't hear from God straight, it doesn't appear. She heard from someone else. Or perhaps she's kind of making that up herself. However it happened, Eve had some ignorance on this one. She did not hear straight from God. If you are coming here every Sunday, and this is the sum total of your spiritual experience, listening to Pastor Dave, and by the way, Pastor Dave is a phenomenal teacher. He really is. He'll divide the word, and I think correctly, but if you only have God's word spoken to you through a human, you are in ignorance. 
the only way for you to hear the very words of God for yourself is to grab the word and read it. There's a reason why Pastor Dave keeps saying we've got to be in the word, we've got to be in the word, because Satan loves to expose any ignorance that we might have. And if we are not in the word ourselves, seeing for it ourselves and learning from it, Satan loves to expose our ignorance. There are some people here today who do not probably have a habit of reading the word regularly. You are open to Satan exploiting your ignorance. I don't say that with any malice or any unhappiness towards you. I just, I want you to see what's in the text and to be careful of that. Here's the third scheme that he loves to run. He plays on selfish desire. First, he loves to cast doubt about God's character. He loves to exploit people's ignorance. And he loves to play on selfish desire. As we pick up the story, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. James says it this way in James chapter 1. Each one of us is tempted when, by his or her own evil desire, he or she is dragged away and enticed. Now here's the truth of the matter, is that in this congregation today, the people sitting in this room, there are evil desires within each of us. And we don't like to talk about them very much. We like to kind of put on the neat, tidy face, come to church, make it look like we're doing well. But inside of each single one of us, there are evil desires, and Satan loves to play on those. I had one exposed in me a few weeks ago. And this is where the sermon gets very personal for me, and it's going, I'm going to warn you ahead of time, it's going to sound funny. But it's in all seriousness. And I don't mind if you laugh during part of it, because it is humorous. Uh, I learned probably four or five years ago, as my boys started getting older, that they loved Legos. Do we have any Lego lovers in here? That's what I'm talking about. And they also loved Star Wars. And I thought, what better present than Star Wars Legos? So I went to the store to look at them. And do you know what I found out about Star Wars Legos? They're wicked expensive. <laughs> Man. So I'm like, well, I'll go on eBay and I'll find out how much. You know, they're like 50 bucks in the store. I'm like, I'll go see on eBay. I bet I can get it for 20 or 30. So I went on eBay and they were selling for like 80. Comes the dawn. Oh, if I went and bought 40 of those and then I sold them on eBay. Wow, hey. And so I began this, kind of just dabbled in Legos and buying here and there and selling them on eBay. It was all fine, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's not the problem. However, two weeks ago, Dave talked about uh, walking in darkness. And I found that for me, as I ventured into this, I found my mind consumed with thinking about Legos and selling and making money. Does anyone have any, now I'm not talking Legos, but has anyone ever been consumed by a thought before? And the rest of you are lying. <laughs> I know, for me it's Legos, for you I don't know what it is. And you know what, there's other things for me. This is an easy one to talk about and it's, it gets the point across. For me, I found myself often thinking, even sometimes here in church, Dave's preaching and I'm thinking, oh, I wonder what deal Fred Myers has got going today. And I would talk to my wife about it, and truthfully, my wife was not real thrilled with my Lego addiction. <laughs> and uh, and I, 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 it's okay, it's, it's a good thing, it's a good thing. And uh, it was very clear when Dave preached two weeks ago, and he said, if you're walking in darkness, today you can experience freedom by standing. So I remember sitting in my seat two weeks ago and thinking, I don't want to stand. I, don't, I hate standing. I hate when he does this. And, uh, I mean, really, and I'm thinking, I don't want to admit this. I know I've got darkness, and I know that the times when I've come forward or I've stood, there's a measure of freedom that God has granted to me. So I'm kind of torn, because on one hand, I'm feeling like I would prefer to just keep this thing okay, I can manage it, it's not bad, it's not awful, I'm not hurting anybody. And on the other side, going, boy, I just would like freedom. 
If you've ever been in this spot, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so when Dave asked if anybody wanted to stand, I will confess, I refused. Until a young guy who had been in our youth ministry while I served there stood up about two rows ahead of me. And I'm so grateful for that young guy because it gave me the courage to stand up. And I told the Lord, I said, you know, Lord, I, uh, I want to be free of this. And uh, hello, my name is John, and I am a Lego addict. <laughs> and I've been clean for two weeks now. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I don't make light of any addiction things. That's not in any way. I know it sounds silly with Legos, but here's the point. That's just one way our hearts can be grabbed. Our hearts can be grabbed by money, greed, they can be grabbed by lust, they can be grabbed by jealousy, they can be grabbed by suspicion, by anger, by bitterness. And I think that what Satan loves to do is play on those selfish desires that we have. And if today you can sense that the Spirit is saying to you, wow, yeah, you, you have some of those things, then this is a sermon for you. In 2 Timothy 2.4, I kept hearing this as I was doing the Lego stuff. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Again, I believe that what God calls us to is realizing that we are in an army right now. We are soldiers, not against humans, not against flesh and blood. We are fighting heavenly forces. And when we are suddenly tied down by the things of this world and engaged so much that they occupy our thinking, nothing wrong with dealing with the things of the world. We can't leave the world, but if they occupy our thinking so much to the point that we are preoccupied with them, they master us, Satan has played on our selfish desires. And this is the really interesting thing as I was studying this, 2 Corinthians 11.3. This refers, Paul, talking about the very story we're talking about. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Question. When you think about your devotion to Christ, do those two adjectives go with it? Sincere and pure. Because two weeks ago, I definitely would say, ah, I'm muddled. Is there anything that's blocking you from having that sincere and pure devotion to Jesus Christ? Let's move to point two. A path of picks solidified the scheme. I'll explain that. Again, the scheme is that Satan loves to steal, kill, and destroy. And so he's got this picks, these choices that are made in this narrative. And we're going to walk through these choices and take a look at them and what they look like. They each, as they get chosen, solidify Satan destroying. And here's the point A, that this was a slippery slope. All of these picks, these choices that the Adam and Eve are making seem to just take us right on a slippery slope. And we're even going to illustrate that. If you're a, a chart kind of person, this one came to me as I was thinking about it. Really, it starts with temptation, but temptation doesn't have to lead to sin. In this case, it did. And here's our first slide, sin. You could write that up at the top right if you like to. And in this narrative, you've got sin, and sin very easily can lead to fear and embarrassment. When I sin, I don't want people to find out. You know, I thought, I thought about it. the first hour I told a, a story about when I was a kid and, and a little bit I thought, man, it's just too easy to tell stories about when I was very young because then it makes it sound like I don't really struggle with this anymore. When I sin, I think, oh, I hope people don't find out about that. Why did I do that? And that is a choice that we can make. There are times when I choose that route and in our section, Genesis 3-7, listen to what happened. 
The eyes, both of them were open and they realized that they were naked and so they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. Immediately there was this embarrassment. It's like, oh, we're naked. We've got to hide. We've got to have this. And I was trying to think, do we have anything today that's similar where we try to clothe ourselves with fig leaves or something like that? And I couldn't think of fig leaves, but this popped into my mind right here. Okay, this is just kind of for light entertainment purposes. You know, duct tape, it's not the same. But I did like that final one. With the tape's insulating value, you'll be the hottest couple on the dance floor. <laughs> we don't necessarily clothe ourselves with fig leaves today. But Adam put it really well in verse 10 where he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. Fear and embarrassment. And often when, that, when those emotions come into us, our natural reaction is to go into hiding. When we have fear and embarrassment, what I want to do is try to keep this as secret as I can. The reason I don't want to stand is because if somebody sees that I'm struggling, it's very embarrassing and I don't want to have to do that. And so we go into hiding. Look at, here's the end of that verse that we just read. Adam said, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And we can hide lots of ways today. You know, we can just try to keep things quiet. We try not to be in community with anybody. Well, if I don't really have to tell anybody about what I'm doing. By the way, if you're not in a small group or you're not in an accountability relationship, what they were talking about today, what Scott was saying about being with those single guys, that is so critical to this. Because it's too easy to hide if you're not in a relationship like that. And I can hide by simply just getting busy. And I can hide by just trying to avoid people. And I can hide by coming to church every Sunday and I can put a smile on. And when I see somebody, I'll be like, hey, how's it going? Fine. How about you? Fine. And we can hide. I, I, yeah, lots of stories. We all, we, you guys, we know what it's like to hide. We do it very well. And if you're not doing it at this moment, you probably have done it or will do it. And then there comes that day when you can hide no longer because you've been exposed. And that's our next little slide. This is so interesting to me. God comes to Adam, and look what he does. It's our next little thing. God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from that tree that I commanded you not to eat from? I, in, in the one-year Bible, I read day two today earlier this morning, and as I read it, when he deals with Cain, after Cain kills Abel, God goes to Cain, first thing, he knows that Cain killed Abel, but first thing he does is he says, where's your brother? God is into asking questions. It's a th here's a thought. As a parenting strategy, perhaps when our kids do something wrong, rather than going, what did you do that for? That was so wrong. What if we just said, so what did you just do? I don't know. Maybe, I mean, maybe God's gone to something here. <laughs> but he asks a question, and what is Adam going to say? Well, I, uh, I uh, yeah, I ate the fruit. I'm sorry. <laughs> Like God caught him. He's exposed. There's no way to, to try to get around it. And so he hides as exposed. And here's the next step is he blames. He plays the blame game. It's so easy to have this slippery slope to go from sin to fear and embarrassment to hiding. But when then you're exposed, you go into the blame mode. And what was Adam's response? Look at her. What was Eve's response? Look at the snake. And we can go, and we can have all kinds of blaming. We can blame other people. Well, God, it's that wife you gave me who, you know, doesn't honor me like I would hope that she would. Well, it's that husband you gave me who won't lead me like he should. Well, it's that job you gave me, that boss who's just obnoxious. What's those parents you gave me? They parented me all wrong. I messed up because of them. And we can blame all we want to. And that's really natural. 
You know what, I have a little a video clip. And, uh, and this is a phrase that I want you to see if you can pick out the operative phrase in this video clip. Okay, so it's not very long. You'll really have to pay attention. See if you can catch it. Here we go. Sorry, was me. Ah! Wasn't me. Wasn't me. You've been awake. No. No, no, it wasn't me. It, it, it was the hairy one. <gasps> Put on the surface oh! of Mars. Whoops. No! Ah! It wasn't me. Wasn't me! <laughs> okay, so what's our phrase? It wasn't me. It wasn't me. And that is the natural response to when we get caught. It wasn't me. There's a, here's a reason. Here's my justification. This is what it is. And ultimately, the slippery slope ends in this last one. It's death. It ends in death. Sin leads to death eventually, and that's our slippery slope. Let me show you point B. There is, in all of this, there's an alternate choice available. In each step here, there was an alternate choice that was available. I don't want to move too quickly. Alternate choice available. Now let's go to the next thing. Have you noticed, do you see all those, I don't know if you can tell, but I yellowed out the arrows. At every step of the, of the way, it's like they're proceeding down the left side. But if they went to the other way, there's a choice that they could have made at any point and that we can make at any point that takes us a different route than the sin slippery slope. And that's all I want to say about it right now. All right, point three. If you have an idea, by the way, what that other choice is, sometimes when Dave's preaching, I'll try to guess what's coming. You could write it down and see if you're right. But that's all I want to say for right now. Point three. God schemed to bring life. Satan schemed to destroy. And then a bunch of poor picks pretty much made his destruction the way he wanted it. But God schemed, even back then, to bring life. If Satan's goal is to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10, 10, the second half sums up God's. I have come that they might have life and what? Have it to the full. That's what God is all about. Now you do need to understand that point A, poor picks precipitated punishment. Sorry, I pulled a page out of Dave's alliteration book. Poor picks precipitated punishment. What in the world? Just the fact that they chose sin meant that they had to be punished. Because sin has to be punished. In our chart, in our slippery slope, what's the end result of sin? It's death. In fact, Romans 6.23 says this, that the wages of sin is death. And we have to know that all sin needs to be punished. I like how Romans 2.5 puts it. It says, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart that you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When his, what kind of judgment? Is righteous judgment. If somebody walked into your life, killed someone who you loved very much, and simply walked away unpunished, you, everything in your being would cry out, that is wrong. They cannot get away with that. And that is the part of you that's been created in the image of God. Because God is a just God. And he cannot tolerate when sin happens. And so there needs to be punishment, but it's righteous. And it's not that God is up there sadistically wanting to just wail on people because he's mad at them. Last night I had a chance to talk with a gentleman and he is, his, his framework of God was really interesting to me because he thought that it was, Christianity was mainly about doing good, right things. Now that's part of what we do as believers. We need to work out our faith. But I think he had this idea that, that our God was just up there trying to nail people when they got out of line. And that's not at all what God is about. God is a just, holy God, which means he's perfect, and he will punish sin, and he must because of his character. But there is something in point 3b that is so exciting. And I, I know this from personal experience. 
when we have point 3B, we fill it in, and then we do this. And we're ready to go. There's still about like 45 minutes left after this one. So 3B, here it is. Promise preceded punishment. Now understand this. The promise preceded the punishment. What do you mean by that, John? Well, God is about to curse creation, and he's going to deal with this. He's going to say, because you sinned, here are the ramifications. But before he even gets to that, Genesis 3.15 happens. The only curse that he gives, here we go in Genesis 3.15, he curses the serpent, or Satan, and he says, I'll put enmity, hatred, between you and the woman, and between your seed, your offspring, and hers. And he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, this is so exciting. That second half of that verse, I'm going to put it in yellow. You need to understand that we're not even three chapters in to the Bible, and God is making a statement here about a promise that he's going to take care of. Sin has just entered the world, and someone is going to crush the serpent's head while you're going to strike his heel. This is a reference to the coming of Christ. Sometimes in the uh, winter times, my heels, they get dried or whatever, they crack and they just hurt to walk on them. If you ever had a foot injury, it hurts to walk on it. You kind of limp around, but it's not taking you out. Certainly not fatal. But if you had your head crushed, would that be a problem? What God is saying in Genesis 3.15, before he even pronounces punishment on the world, he says, here's the deal, Satan. You're going to strike my son's heel. You'll kill my son. But oh, Satan, he will rise and he will crush your head. In Genesis 3.15, God's already making a promise to us about how he's going to draw us back to himself before he even starts to punish. That's the God that we serve. And 315, the rest of the one-year Bible, as we're reading through the Bible this next year, the rest of that is all about that story of Genesis 315 simply unfolding and what God's doing with it. Everything, everything that we're going to read this year in the Bible relates back to Genesis 315. It's God's story of how he's about to crush Satan's head. And I think that's pretty exciting. Let me take you back to the slippery slope. I don't know if you can really see it. The arrows pointing to the right are all yellow. So what is this other choice? I mean, what, what, what is the choice that takes us away from sin and fear and embarrassment and hiding and blaming and death? I had these words... Here's what this, this choice takes us toward. It takes us toward forgiveness. It takes us towards confidence, towards freedom and life. And I had someone come up to me after the first service, and she said, hey, I wrote down these words also while you were speaking. She said, this choice takes us towards reconciliation, restoration, relationship, right standing. It takes us toward honor. It takes us toward protection. What is this choice? In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, it says that in Adam, everybody dies. Everybody goes on that left side, slippery slope. Everybody dies. But in Christ, all will be made alive. If you are in Christ, you go the opposite route. You don't go down the slippery slope of sin and death. You go down another wonderful path. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says this, God himself was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Would you read that next phrase with me? Not counting men's sins against them. God does not sit there and catalog all your sins and I'm going to count them against them. He says, I'm going to send you my son. You've all been going down this slippery slope towards death and my son who has never started on that slope and doesn't deserve to die, and doesn't have to die, will willingly choose to die. And when he did choose to die, now that becomes our opportunity to say, 
I'm going to let your death take the place of mine. And remember, God planned that from Genesis 3.15. Have you figured out what the choice is yet? Can you show me the next slide, please? It's this word. Repentance. Repentance, if you've forgotten, is when you're heading toward a direction and you're saying, you know what, I'm not sure, there's a doubt in my mind about the character of God and I don't really believe he's as good as he says he is. Or you say, you know what, in my ignorance, you know what, I'm being deceived and I'm not even bothering to try to hear the words of God. Or you might say, you know what, it's my selfish desires that I've been kind of feeding and I'm going along towards this. You might be in a spot right now where you're sinning and you're fearful and you're embarrassed that you keep falling in that same way. You might be in the mode where you're hiding. I don't want anybody to find out about this. You might be that you've been exposed but you're still blaming and you're heading towards the path of death. Repentance says that I take any of those things and I turn 180 degrees. I say I don't want that anymore. Two weeks ago when I, when I was in the service and Dave said you can stand up I knew it was a moment where I could either keep going towards the stuff that was consuming me in my heart and shrinking my soul, or I could turn around. And I, I need to say this, I made the choice to turn around, which was good, and I wasn't any saint for doing it. I didn't even want to do it until the kids stood up. But I was surprised because not very many people stood up that day. And then actually I came to this service, second hour, my family was at Sunday schools, my wife was serving in the nursery and I didn't have anything I was doing so I just came here for the end of the service and I listened as Dave made the appeal to stand again. And frankly was surprised at how few people stood. Because I know the deceitfulness of sin and I know that we all tangle up in it. When I was thinking about this sermon, I felt like I got to give another opportunity to stand. If today you have been pricked in any of these areas, if the Spirit has said, ooh, yeah, that's one. If your heart started to beat fast, if you were kind of like, oh, pierced on anything, then today is a day to say, God, I want to repent. And in a moment, I'm going to invite you to stand if you would like to. If that's the decision that you want to make, but it is not enough to simply stand today. Because you can stand today and nobody could ever follow up on you, you need to, if that is a decision you want to make, you need to tell somebody. If you're not in a small group, you can write on your welcome card, I'm sure, hey, I need some help, some accountability, I need something, they'll, they'll get it taken care of. It is my hope that today, if we walked in heading a direction that is not right, that we have the opportunity to turn the 180. And that you then tell someone so that you can be kept accountable. It's not a fanfare thing. I'm not going to wait a long time. I'm simply going to end like this. Would you close your eyes? If you today feel that there is an area in your life that you have been heading toward any of those things, that I've talked about today, I'm going to ask you, and you want to turn around and turn away from them and have freedom, I'm going to ask you to stand. Please do not worry about what somebody else is doing. This is between you and God. And there are some of you who aren't going to stand, and that's okay because not everybody has to. I had a guy come to me between the services and say that two weeks ago, 
a gentleman came up to him and said, God told me you were going to stand. I need to pray for you. And for those who aren't standing, that might be what God has for you today. James 5.16 says, Confess your faults one to another. Pray for another that you may be healed. I'm going to pray for you today. And when I'm done praying, you're dismissed. But please, don't let it stop here. Let me pray. Jesus, I know that all of us need to repent many times each day. Lord, we want to turn away. We don't want to be deceived by Satan. We don't want that death route. I pray for these people specifically who took this step of standing. I pray you would grant them freedom. I pray that they would have the fullness of what you are offering to them. And Lord, if there is something that needs to be unlocked or released, I pray that you would begin to do that work. In your power, Holy Spirit, would you come, fill them up, Thank you for how you meet us so willingly when we take any steps towards you. Spirit, we ask that you would do this now for the glory of Jesus. Amen.